Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we talk about congestive heart failure, and hopefully by the end of the video, you will feel more prepared to take care of these patients. Since I can already expect you already possess basic understanding of the patho, we'll briefly cover what it is and signs and symptoms. Then, we'll spend more time going over treatments commonly used and nursing specific tips. Thanks for joining. So simply, Congestive heart failure is the heart losing its ability to pump or squeeze blood to the body effectively, leading to congestion, or in other words, volume overload within the body. Because the heart doesn't pump as effectively, it also doesn't meet the body's demands. These issues often lead to your patients presenting with weakness, dizziness, shortness of breath, chest pain, and most commonly edema. Typically, they also present very hypertensive from how much fluid is within their body. However, as ER nurses, we have to be very vigilant. So keep in mind that your CHF patients in an exacerbation are also never too far off from frank cardiogenic shock. So be on the lookout for things that can signal your patient is in shock, like mottled skin, cool extremity, cyanosis, and hypotension despite your patient being in fluid overload. The common assessment finding is edema in the lower extremities, as seen on the image on the left. However, what tends to bring patients into the ER is pulmonary edema, as this leads to the patient becoming increasingly short of breath, to the point where they feel out of breath just sitting down. And forget about sleeping, as they feel like they're drowning when they're laid flat, due to the fluid accumulating inside their lungs. If you want to go further into assessments, please watch my video on respiratory and cardiac assessments. The really sick heart failure patients can show signs of shock like mottled skin and cyanosis. Mottled skin is shown on the image to the left, characterized by patchiness and streaks. Then cyanosis on the image to the right, as seen by discoloration of the fingers. Of course, these signs here are not specific to cardiogenic shock, but anytime you see this, it should signal to you that your patient is potentially very, very sick and should be assigned a greater priority over other patients who are perhaps not as sick. Now let's briefly go over some common questions you should be asking your CHF patients. Are they taking their medications as prescribed? Because if they aren't, it can be the reason of why this exacerbation is occurring. Have they noticed themselves gaining weight rapidly as this signals edema building up? Also, do they have to be propped up at night to sleep as this can show that pulmonary edema has been developing? You can also ask, has this ever happened to you before? You'll find that a lot of your patients are experts when it comes to their conditions and can sometimes flat out tell you, hey, I'm having another CHF exacerbation because I haven't been taking my meds. I'm just here for some water pills. I've had this happen to me plenty of times, so it's always good to ask your patients, has this ever happened to you before? Now let's go into discussing the workup. Although we are not providers, I find it useful to know why certain things are ordered, why I'm doing things, as this helps plan my care, helps me be more proactive, and essentially having more knowledge is always better. Providers will try to find the cause of the heart failure. Is it related to an arrhythmia that can be reversed? or ACS, or street drugs, or any other cause. And then as far as labs, a BNP will be ordered. And we know that a BNP is released by the heart when overstretching occurs within the heart as a result of there being too much pressure within the heart itself. A CBC can show the presence of anemia, which as we know, in anemia, the heart rate will increase to compensate for the body's demands, but this extra work on the heart can eventually lead to heart failure. A CBC can also be useful with assessing for an infection. A basic metabolic panel will assess for kidney function, which is needed to know if the patient is going to be given diuretics like furosemide. It will also yield electrolytes, liver function, and so forth. A troponin will also be ordered to assess for an NMI or cardiac damage, as this can also precipitate heart failure. Next, an EKG will most likely be ordered to assess for arrhythmias or cardiac ischemia or infarction. A bedside ultrasound and portable chest x-ray will be used 
will be useful um, when looking at the lungs for edema and congestion and for seeing the size of the heart. And then an echocardiogram will be more in depth, right? Looking at heart muscle valves and obtaining an ejection fraction. Super quick, let's go over what an ejection fracture is. So an ejection fraction is just the percentage of the amount of blood that leaves the heart with each contraction. And the normal EF is approximately above 55%. So when your patient comes in and they're an EF of like 10%, 15%, that's very, very, very low, right? So it kind of gives you a gauge of how their CHF has progressed. So that's also going to be an important question that you need to ask your patients. Hey, do you know what your ejection fracture or EF is? So include that on the questions that you should be asking your CHF patients. Okay, so now let's start going over treatments, which is going to be the meat of the video, right? So... As with any other patient, the ABCs need to be handled first. Does your patient need to be intubated related to them having a low GCS score or being just in frank respiratory failure? Do they need more pressure support right off the bat? So if you want to go more in depth regarding the ABCs, I'll tag my video here. But besides the ABCs, some of the initial actions that, you, that need to occur when your patient first arrives includes placing them on oxygen, which is often going to be a non-rebreather since it's easy and quick to put on, plus it delivers high concentrations of oxygen. Then your patient needs to be connected to the monitor so you can get a set of vital signs and also quickly look at their ECG rhythm. Then the next most important thing is going to be placing an IV so that medications can be safely and quickly administered. So keep in mind that these things that are happening often happen simultaneously, but if you're on your own, that should be the order that you follow. Then the typical cocktail for a CHF exacerbation includes BiPAP, nitroglycerin, and furosemide. However, efforts or efforts are going to be given to treat or try to reverse precipitating conditions that led to the patient going into an exacerbation, like we discussed, whether an arrhythmia, ACS, drugs, anemia, et cetera, et cetera. But when they present in just frank CHF exacerbation with a bunch of fluid and edema everywhere, the BiPAP, the nitroglycerin, and furosemide is the usual cocktail that providers will be ordering. So let's go over BiPAP, a form of non-invasive ventilation. Just like shown on the image above, it delivers continuous pressure on inhalation and expiration as well as high levels of oxygen. This pressure that it delivers helps maintain an open alveoli and it helps push back the fluids from the lungs back into the bloodstream. This combined with the high levels of oxygen that it can provide really helps CHF patients with breathing and preventing intubation. So due to the pressure that it provides, it can even help with the workload on the heart since it increases intrathoracic pressure. And as we know, by doing this, less blood returns to the heart, which is already strained from so much fluid being there. So less blood returning is going to be a good thing. But just keep in mind, this only applies when your patients are very, very hypertensive. If they're hypotensive, we don't want to decrease the blood returning back to the heart. So to summarize, BiPAP will help with oxygenation and ventilation through the oxygen and pressure that it provides. Now let's talk about nitroglycerin. It's a vasodilator. We're going to discuss how vasodilation helps the heart first, and then we'll go into how it helps the lungs. So usually your CHF patients will be very hypertensive related to how much fluid is within their body. This is where nitroglycerin comes in. So by vasodilating, it decreases the blood returning to the heart, hence decreasing the amount of work the heart has to do. It can also have effects on the arteries. If so, it decreases the force or energy the heart has to use to send blood to the body. Hence, again, decreasing the amount of work the heart has to do. Now let's talk about the lungs. So pulmonary edema and congestion is as a result of there being a lot of pressure within the pulmonary vascular system from how much extra fluids are inside the body. So this pressure drives this extra fluid into the lungs. So by giving nitroglycerin a vasodilator, which opens up these vessels, the pressure decreases and fluids aren't being forced into the lungs. 
Now, because of that, I hope that you're seeing how it's extremely beneficial for these patients to be on BiPAP and nitroglycerin since one provides pressure from within the lungs to push the extra fluid back into the vessels, which is BiPAP, right? While the other lowers the pressure within the vessels, opening them up and now allowing the fluids to be pushed back out of the lungs. And that's going to be um, nitroglycerin, right? So you see how one provides pressure from one way and the other will decrease the pressure within the vessels. However, a key thing with nitroglycerin is that your patient's blood pressure must be adequate. It can't already be low when you start it because it's going to drive it even lower. It also can cause headaches. So just be aware of that if your patient, um, let your patient know ahead of time. And it shouldn't be used at all if your patients are on phosphodiesterase inhibitors, the medications that are like Viagra, right? As this can lead to severe, severe hypotension. And then another key thing, perhaps one of the more important ones, is that it should not be used with your patients who have right ventricular infarction. Because as we know, the right side of the heart fills mostly passively. So if we decrease the amount of blood returning to the heart, this can lead to very, very severe hypotension. Okay, now let's talk about furosemide, commonly known as Lasix. To keep it simple, it's a diuretic. Your patients are in fluid overload, so we have to get that fluid out. Keep an eye on the electrolytes, specifically potassium, but keep an eye on overall the overall electrolytes. Keep an eye on kidney function. And again, if your patient is hypotensive, you cannot use this because it will drive the BP even lower when you start getting rid of fluids. So the BP issue must be addressed before you start using Lasix. Your really critical patients that are already in shock will need vasopressor support as the other therapies discussed cannot be used if the patient is hypotensive related to being in shock. Because if they're in shock, BiPAP, nitroglycerin, and Lasix can't be used because these will drive the BP even lower. So vasopressor support is used so that other therapies can be used like the BiPAP. So which is the go-to vasopressor that we're going to uh, be using for cardiogenic shock? If you watch my vasopressor video, you should know this. If not, go on over and take a look at that. Um, but then after vasopressor support, cardiology should have been contacted by your ER providers because they're going to have other treatment methods. They're going to have surgical or even mechanical interventions that can be performed. All right. So now let's get into the actual important stuff. How do we start an IV if there is a bunch of edema everywhere? I had the same exact question once upon a time. So it requires two things, patience and pressure. What you do is apply pressure to where you want to look for a vein long enough so that the edema that's there subsides for a little bit, giving you enough time to look for and start an IV. Patient is necessary because it can take several minutes for this edema to get displaced. And I think that a, a good site that has worked for me in the past for placing IVs in these CHF patients that have a lot of edema is going to be in the hands because you can put pressure with both of your hands, driving the extra fluid back up and hopefully um, showing you what veins are present and giving you enough time to start that IV. So again, pressure and patience to get that fluid back up giving you enough time to place that IV. Next, although it's kind of obvious, but still important, it's to elevate the head of the bed. This will help the patient with breathing, and it will just a little bit decrease the blood return to the heart. And as we discussed, that's really helpful because it decreases the amount of work the heart has to do. There's some OG nurses that I've seen even have their patients dangle their feet. I don't do that, but if you see that and you get taught that at your own facility, um, you do you. A key thing with this is that once you're going to be giving the Lasix though, you want the fluid to go back to the kidney so that it can get excreted. So at some point, it may be necessary to elevate their lower extremities at least a little bit without compromising their respiratory drive, right? And making them go back into pulmonary, uh, into pulmonary edema, right? So another tip is going to be don't ever trust your first blood pressure, especially in really sick patients. I think that all the movement of getting them on the gurney and everything happening gives the BP a little boost initially, but once the pa the patient settles in, it dumps. So what I recommend is, yeah, take that first blood pressure, but then retake it just to make sure that it's a legit one, right? So don't trust your first blood pressure. And then don't trust your first BPs, especially if you're starting on nitroglycerin, 
go ahead and take it over and over at least like every five minutes especially when starting any like blood pressure medication you just want to see how your patient responds to this medication and then after giving lasix some of your patients are going to be waterworks right off the bat so plan ahead have a urinal or even two urinals uh, like easily accessible what about a condom cath what about placing a pure wick on your female patients or even having a bedside commode readily available and then if your patient is really 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 sick thinking about a foley can also be useful and then although we already discussed this if your patient is hypotensive you cannot give nitrates lasix or even opioids for pain as these can uh decrease the bp for, for example morphine right but one of the which narcotic pain medication can be given that doesn't decrease the bp as much so i'll give you a second to see if you can think about it we talked about it in other videos but we'll kind of talk about it here again fentanyl right so fentanyl doesn't have too much of an effect on blood pressure and you can keep that in mind if you have other patients who are hypotensive and need something for bp fentanyl may be a good choice and then one final tip is that don't forget to teach your patients um i've had patients in the past with heart failure who never received any formal education whether this was because of a lack of insurance and they didn't just get the training or didn't go to a class or perhaps it was lack of interest by the patient but at the end it doesn't matter i think that a little education on sodium and fluid restrictions and medications and even on taking like their daily weights can go a long way because maybe you might be the only person who's ever taught them or will ever teach them about this kind of stuff so take the time to teach your patients um don't forget why you became a nurse you, you're doing it to help people right so that's it for the tips let's go into the question of the day what do you need to confirm before using a central line placed in the subclavian or internal jugular vein so let me know what you guys have and as always the answer to this would be at the bottom of the description text thank you for your time today i hope that at least i was able to teach you one thing if you want to keep learning i've listed my favorite er nursing related books in the description with my favorite being Sheehy's, of course, and the Case Files. I think those are my two favorite ones as well. Please take the time to watch my other videos. I would really appreciate that. Also, if you want to support the channel, I have nursing stickers and nursing shirts up on Redbubble that you can check out if you can. And then again, I just want to say it again. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate you. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day.